Leszek Borisowicz is Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. He's just about wrapping up a two week visit to India. By the way, it's his fifth, I believe, since he took office uh, of Vice Chancellor in 2010. Boris, if I may call you that, course, uh, yeah. thank you for being with us today. So you're on your fifth trip to India. Mm -hmm. This one's been two weeks. Um, I'm going to take that as an indicator of your interest in India and the Correct. interest that the University of Cambridge has in India. Is that fair? That's entirely fair. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about the pressing question, which to me is whether or not there's enough collaboration between, you know, research institutions, ac academic institutions, and industry um, in India. And I'd like you to reflect on what Cambridge has experienced on that front and what results it's yielded, which can apply to India as well. Well, firstly, the interactions that Cambridge is seeking with India uh, in the future are really based around research predominantly, and therefore postgraduate and other activities uh, between our institution and strong top-level institutions here in, in India. So we have a partnership of equals. Cambridge has a very strong relationship with uh, the industry and commercial sector in Cambridge. We are widely regarded as the largest cluster that has been created in Europe. And let me just put that in context. Cambridge University sits in a relatively small city. It's only 100,000 people. It's tiny by the size of any city in, in uh, India. Um, we have a surrounding population which leaves a local population of around 600,000 people. That's 1% of the UK population. Over the last 50 years, coming from the university and engaged with the university, we've now created 1,500 companies. That has created 58,000 jobs for that population of, uh, uh, of 600,000. And now 17% of all high-tech startups in the UK are in Cambridgeshire in this, uh, to this small population. Why? Because the university, I believe, acts as an important innovation hub uh, for these activities, and we're able to spin that out and engage others. The second part of that phenomenon is what's happened. Because of that entrepreneurial spirit the university has fostered, big corporations have moved in. Microsoft, AstraZeneca just this year has decided to move its global headquarters to Cambridge. Rolls-Royce, BP, a whole lot of other uh, enterprises are now engaged with this cluster that we actually have. I haven't yet seen anything similar in happening India. on that scale in India. Now, there may be two reasons for that. It could be that, as yet, there isn't enough recognition of the innovation and the importance of the higher education or the IIT sector in creating paradigm-shifting discoveries that actually can create that type of environment. Or it may be that the uh, ability to invest in new ideas in, in this direction may be overshadowed by innovation that's occurring in the business sector itself. I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is that as we collaborate with uh, Indian institutions, we equally look to collaborate with uh, Indian commercial enterprises, and that means that gradually we will find out where those are. I encourage people to look at the Cambridge model, pick what might work, and then develop a distinctive model for their own institutions here. There isn't a right way of doing it, it just seems to have worked very well for Cambridge. The fact that you now have a circle of advisors, Indian origin, Indian business people, academics, government representatives, um, advising you, um, is that really a reflection of that commitment to collaborating with everybody here in India? listening to what they have to say, looking for solutions together on the R&D side. So you have to understand that what Cambridge is seeking is real partnership. Our choice in making India very special for us is that we see an enormous amount of excellence uh, here in Indian institutions. What we want to do is to collaborate as equals. That means a bi-directional flow of activity and embedding some of our activity right here in India. Now, if we are to embark on that. What the circle of advisors I hope will help us with is actually to give us an Indian perspective, to make sure that what we're studying is relevant to the India of today, um, advise us as to whether there are competitors already in this domain, who the best collaborator, collaborators might be, and to give us a perspective whereby how we may be able to get into a position where the work that we're engaged in jointly can actually be translated effectively to real benefit for people in India. So it's a serious commitment, it's a measure of the seriousness of the commitment that we wish to hear so much about the views and perspectives that come from India. 
oh yes, there was an advisory board before, but it was based in London. And that to me seemed very anachronistic when we're trying to forge partnerships here. So talk about your commitment to India and your commitment to, you know, research in India. Um, for the uninitiated, what are the areas that you're focusing on and which are showing the most traction? Okay. Well, we started off with a very major uh, development in chemical biology and therapeutics. And this is jointly with the National Center for Biological Sciences based in Bangalore, uh, linking one of our major professors, Professor Ashok Venkatarman, uh, who's the, uh, an oncologist uh, based in Cambridge. And they're looking at new ways of tackling drug discovery. To give you an idea, there are potentially 200,000 pathways in a cell that could be targeted with drugs. Conventional approaches to drug discovery have identified 1,200 of those pathways. We're looking to find answers to the other 190,000. That's how ambitious the, the projects are. But huge implications, if even it works to a 1% level, the opportunity for, for that development. That is attracting interest from some of the Indian pharmaceutical industries. So again, we have this partnership developing. And that has been funded in the Indian Center by uh, DBT, the Department for Biotechnology. And we're delighted that that is off the ground. In fact, during this visit, I was able to open the laboratories where um, staff from Cambridge working jointly with uh, the National Center staff are going to be based. So that is up off the ground. We had some long discussions with IIT Bombay where we have an extant collaboration in nanosciences. The question now is as we move on to that greater sense of collaboration, could we build this around nanosciences and healthcare? We're also looking for collaborations in plant sciences and how they can deliver some solutions to the food security problem so that Cambridge and Indian institutions can be helping to tackle that nine billion uh, people question which is global, it isn't just about India. We have interest in the arts and humanities that we wish to also explore. Cambridge isn't just a, a group of techies. We actually yeah. are a very broad-based university. And also there are areas in engineering, particularly in the manufacturing sector, that have great interest to institutions here. We won't expand much beyond those boundaries because we want to explore the depth of a relationship we can establish. And we are looking to long-lasting relationships. So these are not fly-by-night operations where we discover something will be off in a trice. The aim is, is to build long-lasting partnerships that are to the benefit of both the Indian institution and Cambridge in the long term. Which brings me to a fundamental question, and perhaps I should have asked this first. Why is India so strategically important to the University of Cambridge? Well, un underlying it, um, is a question of excellence. Now you may say, but oh gosh, but we don't have Indian institutions in the top 200 uh, of World League tables. Well, flatly, Cambridge tends to ignore uh, World League tables. Why do I know there's excellence? Under, very early on, when I was starting at the University of Cambridge, I asked a question, which is how many projects are up and running between Cambridge and India? Now we only have about 1,400 academic staff as an institution, very small, in those which are deemed to be at the top of the global universities tables. But of those 1,400 staff, we have between two to 300 active projects in India already. So we're building on a foundation where investigator to investigator, they've already identified the excellent counterpart. What we're now trying to do is to make sure the projects which are usually short term and finish when the funding runs out, that what we are able to do now is to build longevity and sustainability into that model through these partnerships. And that's why India, it is a very um, objective judgment as to why India could be very special uh, for us in terms of building such relationships. We'll leave it at that, Boris. Thank you very much for your time and for your insights. Thank you. Thank you.